Next to present in our historical series is Dr. Stephen Rathgerber. Stephen trained in paediatrics and paediatric cardiology at BC Children's Hospital in Vancouver, Canada. He came to Sick Kids last year to be our interventional cardiology fellow. Calm, cool and collected in any situation, the entire CAF department loved working with him and he was a valued member of our team from the moment he arrived. He returned to Vancouver this summer to take up a position as a staff cardiologist and an interventionalist at BC Children's. Today he presents on the history of percutaneous procedures. It's highly entertaining and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much for presenting, Stephen. So, so this is a discussion story on the history of interventional cardiology, um, initially in general, and then we'll move on to more of pediatric, uh, to the pediatric story um, over the last about 40, 50 years. Um, and so this goes back a, a long way. So the fascination of cannulating hollow organs actually goes back to early civilization with the Egyptians. So experiments dated back to 3000 BC uh, documenting medical procedures, remarkably reminiscent actually of modern techniques for angioplasty that have only now been developed over the last half century. And we'll come back to that as well. So it's a bit of foreshadowing. So on, although involving usually just the gastrointestinal and urogenital systems, as opposed to the vascular system, it was documented that serial insertion of reeds of various sizes were used to treat urethral strictures uh, back in these days by applying gradually increasing amount of shear force. So I imagine early pioneering efforts and anesthesia would have been valued concurrently with these experiments. This fascination persisted into Greek times. So Galen and Hippocrates um, participated in experiments initially with cadaveric uh, vessels uh, as well as as well as ca cadavers themselves um, to inject air, water uh, into in, into vessels uh, using hollow reeds and brass pipes. Uh, to better understand how valves functioned. Uh, and from these experiments, it was Galen uh, who developed the initial theory of circulation. Um, and that remained the, the the prevailing understanding of circulation for, for centuries, uh, where blood actually, he, he believed and uh, postulated that blood circulated from the liver uh, and served as a center of circulation. So this theory persisted for centuries until the mid 17th century when uh, William Harvey uh, began performing experiments catheterizing IVCs and cadavers uh, and at that point accurately demonstrated the venous flow flowed back to the lungs as opposed to the periphery as first um, described by Galen. Um, he wrote a manuscript de describing venous and arterial circulation uh, negating the previous um, uh, theories by those physicians uh, and those early experiments were very accurate uh, with our current understanding of circulation. Um, so early on, um, uh, although people were fascinated with heart function, the barrier to getting there was getting access to the vascular system. And this is really where um, the, the pathway to car interventional cardiology starts. Um, the journey towards accessing and understanding the vascular system was expanded again. Uh, by an English man named Christopher Wren, who took a, le a leap and performed the first documented injection into a live subject. Uh, so this first example of vascular access was performed using a quill connected to a pig bladder. Uh, he proved uh, that his injection was successful by filling the bladder with wine, <clears throat> ale, and opium, and by observing the dog uh, falling intoxicated. He therefore demonstrated the experiment was a success. Uh, this was the tip of the iceberg. Uh, that started the progression towards new methods to access the circulation in order to understand its function and anatomy and provided the necessary stepping stone, stone towards techniques that would allow safe access to the heart. Now, if you're wondering, like I did when I was looking through this, uh, why Christopher Wren may sound familiar um, and a little bit about out of contact with medicine, it turns out that aside from being a famous anatomist in the history books for, uh, for pioneering vascular access and live subjects, he also dabbled in astronomy, mathematics, physics, architecture, and in his spare time managed to design St. Paul's Cathedral in London, along with 50 other churches to aid in the rejuvenation of, of the city of London after the Great Fire. Uh, and later, so in 1667, uh, Johann Daniel Major, a physician from Germany, um, 
it took the next step to perform the first venous injection in a human. Uh, his, cho his choice was to inject opium uh, as and found that it was a poor choice of uh, of the first injection as it yields an, yielded an adverse outcome in his subject and uh, replicating the experiments were deferred for some time after this. Uh, adv advancement in vascular access also played a part in the development of blood transfusions at the time uh, with Richard Lower being the first to report a transfusion from an animal to a human uh, that was successful uh, performing a hollow quill performed using a hollow quill and silver pipes. So this was successful from a vascular access point and only a small part of an interesting story surrounding transfusion medicine, um, which also has an important and interesting history to, to review. So with the newfound comfort in accessing the vascular system, this really set the stage for an English clergyman named Stephen Hales. Um, and he had a fascination for blood pressure and cardiac output. Um, uh, so initial experiments that he performed included calculating cardiac output of a horse, and he developed at the time an innovative technique to sacrifice the animal, fill the left ventricle with beeswax, calculate the horse's stroke volume. So his interest in blood pressure prompted him to perform the first described cardiac catheterization in animals. So this involved inserting lines made of brass cannula uh, attached to a glass tube into the neck of a into the neck vessels of a horse to measure both the venous and arterial pressure. So he performed a catheterization of what turned out to be a very hypertensive and poorly anesthetized horse, and the column of blood rose nine feet of blood, nine feet um, with blood pressure above 180 to 120. And so you can see in this picture, Stevens depicted here on the left, observing the seminal cardiac catheterization performed by the first interventional cardiology fellow, who was not credited for his contribution here. Hales provide, proved to be quite ahead of his time, uh, as it was not another century before a French physiologist named Francois Magendi proposed the potential utility for direct measurement of venous and arterial structures by catheterization. He himself did not perform the experiments he conceptualized uh, and left them for an assistant. Uh, so he was scoping out medical schools in 1844 and found a man who failed his medical school exams who was looking for work. His name was Claude Bernard. Um, who took the opportunity to be a research assistant for him. Despite not having an illustrious CV, Claude turned out to be quite productive, performing numerous successful experiments and becoming the first to, re to record many milestones in the field. Uh, and he was the first to officially coin the term cardiac catheterizations in one of his publications in 1844. Uh, he was also the first to record the cardiac pressure of both the right and left ventricles, sample blood at various points in the circulation and describe cardiac catheterization in animals via femoral root. Uh, he was also the first to describe a complication after perforating a right ventricle, causing a pericardial hemorrhage. So the importance of documenting and measuring intracardiac pressures was taken to the next level by a veterinarian, Jean-Baptiste Chauveau, and a physician, Etienne Jules of Mary, who invented what was called a cardiograph. Uh, and this was an instrument designed to record uh, intercardiac pressures. Uh, they were able to insert an air-filled ampoule that transmitted pressure recordings to a revolving drum, and he used this to uh, to record the first simultaneous right atrial, right ventricle, and left ventricle tracing, and in doing so proved that systole coincided with the apical beat, which was previously thought to be due to ventricular expansion following atrial contraction. So this is an, another brilliant invention of theirs uh, that later followed was uh, um, a double lumen catheter to record simultaneous right atrial and right ventricular pressures. Um, and it was 1870 that Fick published his now famous formula for calculating cardiac output using oximetry measurements. This has not helped not only help patient management uh, and understanding of hemodynamics, it served to provide material to make cardiac fellows uncomfortable in the cath lab for generations since. Uh, and despite deriving the theory, he was not actually the one who proved its validity and left it for his colleagues to prove 16 years later in 1886 using cardiac catheterization in animals. And for the last 20 years, the 19th century, many other physicians took uh, to animal experimentation in the field of cardiac catheterization using techniques that we've already discussed. Uh, but the next discovery that took the cardiac uh, cath closer to actually reaching the heart was a discovery of x-rays by Wilhelm Röntgen. So he was a mechanical injury, engineer, physicist who earned the inaugural Nobel Prize for this discovery in 1901 and truly ahead of his time as a physicist, 
and seen here also a visionary and beard styling for a modern man in the 21st century as well. Uh, the first x-ray that he published was his wife's hand, uh, seen here on the right. Uh, and following his discovery, it was within the next year that the first fluoroscopic images of a beating heart were recorded by Francis Henry Williams in 1896. Uh, he's seen here recording an image of one of the subjects with a portable fluoroscopic setup. Uh, and the opportunities to x-ray imaging continue to advance. Um, and in 1896, uh, Hashik and Otto Linenthal uh, mixed a uh, chalk, mercury sulfide, and Vaseline to perform the first angiogram on an amputated hand. And it was not long before someone extended this understanding of vasculature of the heart. Uh, in 1899, when Walter Baumgarten performed the first coronary angiogram in cadaveric hearts from animals using contrast agents that included air, uh, air, buckshot, lead, and gelatin. By the end of the 19th century, the stage was set to make the leap from animal catheterization to humans, uh, which was a transition marked with some controversy. So in 1905, uh, Fritz Fleischroeder and Ernst Unger worked together and were interested in developing methods to inject medications adjacent to organs affected by specific disease, as it was felt this would be the most effective way to deliver a therapy. Unger somehow managed to convince Bleischroeder that he should be the recipient of the first cardiac catheterization. He attempted this on three occasions by passing catheters through the basilic vein twice and through the femoral vein on one occasion. During one of these attempts, Bleischroeder immediately complained of chest pain, and they both infer that they'd successfully performed the first cardiac catheterization on a human. It's not clear why at this point, but they did not document what they did, uh, neither checked a pressure nor performed an x-ray, and allegedly subsequently performed a similar experiment with three other volunteers, and on no occasion did they document their work. The reason for this is unclear, and some believe that they felt there's no practical significance to what they're doing. They later published a manuscript on catheterization and drug delivery in central veins and arteries without discussing intercardiac access. It was much later that Unger later recalled their work to the public's attention when similar work was reported to great acclaim, both professionally and financially. So seeing as how a human had not officially been catheterized, Werner Forsman saw this as an opportunity as a medical graduate and surgical resident in 1929 in Germany. So his fascination with developing a better way to deliver resuscitation drugs um, was what prompted him to move towards cardiac catheterization and thought that this would be an effective method. So his boss at the time, Dr. Richard Schneider, um, said, I'm sorry, I cannot provide you with patients for the, an experiment of this kind. Uh, despite the opposition, he persevered uh, and elected to pursue pathway of insubordination and self-experimentation. Uh, not being impulsive, he decided to practice on cadavers, confirming the position of catheters by autopsy. He later convinced a colleague to insert a catheter into his arm 35 centimeters before a friend panicked and removed it immediately, despite his insistence. Uh, with the help uh, of a nurse named Gerda Dixon, he managed to convince her to gain access to a, a venesection kit uh, and perform a venous cut down on himself. So he successfully managed to place a urethral catheter into his antecubital fossa all the way to his right atrium. Not to repeat the same mistake of others, he quickly ran to the radiology department to confirm the evidence of the first catheterization in a human. He was later found by colleagues that day with blood running down his arm and a catheter dangling from his antecubital fossa, prompting concern. Uh, they were worried for his welfare, thinking he was trying to commit suicide at the time. And the general impressions of his contemporaries are captured by the following quote. The forceman was always a peculiar person, alone and desolate, hardly ever mingling with his co-workers socially. One ever knew whether he was thinking or mentally deficient. So after word got out about this momentous achievement, he was fired. Uh, despite dismissing him uh, publicly, his, his boss actually validated him privately. Um, and he was encouraged to publish his findings. Further, uh, he was referred to a new position at a hospital in Berlin. Uh, so he took his work, took his advice, published his work, and it was met with reviews, both acclaim and others uh, saying that he was reckless. And it was at this time that Unger came out of the woodwork, accusing him of plagiarism. And despite Forsman publishing an addendum to, the acknowledge, to acknowledge the work of Unger, um, uh, Forsman was ultimately credited with performing the first human heart catheterization. Uh, so the controversy around this publication and Unger's allegations led him to being fired again um, from his job in Berlin, saying that his reckless methods were not meant for a respected hospital. 
So unfortunately, Forsman never practiced cardiology again and pursued other interests. Um, and uh, in the medical field, uh, despite this, his deft hand at catheterization benefited his future patients as he turned to a career in urology. And following this, he moved to a humble career as a country doctor, or so he thought. Fully did he know that the impact of his contribution um, was uh, was followed by others. So the progress of the field uh, in cardiac cath and included ind individuals uh, Andre Frederick Cornon and, Dickin and Dickinson Woodruff Richards, uh, who both studied right heart physiology in 1936. They used modified urethral catheters measuring right heart pressures and cardiac output with oximetry. Uh, these two also introduced double lumen catheters. Um, and the early research by Forsman and these two uh, with their practical techniques led them to share the Nobel Prize in 1956. So the application of cardiac catheterization in the field of congenital heart disease uh, stems from this. And in the mid-1940s, uh, it was uh, James uh, Warren, uh, a physician in Ohio, performed the first or performed the first cardiac catheterization on patients with congenital heart disease, including ASD and VSD. Um, so one important aspect of right heart catheterization, catheterization that had not been performed by this time was the assessment of the pulmonary arteries. And this was discovered and performed for the first time by the cardiologist, Lewis Dexter. Uh, he was at the time um, doing a catheterization to assess a patient's renal veins when he suddenly had an urge to investigate the patient's heart. And so this is his quote. Well, I decided to wander around the heart, which I understood was above the diaphragm somewhere. Suddenly this catheter came out of the lung field and I was sure I had perforated the heart. I didn't have any idea what to do. I turned on the overhead light and said, Mr. S, how are you? He said, I feel a hell of a lot better than you look. Then I was pretty sure that I, I have just perforated the heart. It was sort of just, it just sort of sealed its, itself off. And I wondered what would happen when I pulled it back. So I closed my eyes. I then pulled the catheter back and nothing happened. And then it was all over. I put my little Band-Aid on his wound and I went to, to look up the anatomy of the chest and figured I'd gone into the pulmonary artery. With this discovery, he continued to catheterize pulmonary arteries in a deliberate fashion and was also the first to describe the pulmonary wedge position to measure left atrial pressure. So x-ray technology continued uh, in parallel, uh, and by the late 1940s, film cassette changers were developed. Uh, at first, these were manual and then automatic to allow for series of images to be taken. Seen here is a serial fluoroscopy showing SVC stenosis. Um, it was not long after uh, this that there was the development of cine angiograms and roll film and image intensifiers in the early 1950s. Uh, so other developments in the first half of the 20th century, along with right heart catheterization and angiography, included new iodinated contrast agents that were safe. Uh, at this stage, the next step was to progress to catheterization of the left heart. So in the early 20th century, retrograde access to the aortic valve was felt to be prohibitively dangerous. Uh, safer methods were believed to be direct percutaneous puncture through different approaches. Um, and it was in 1941 that a radiologist, Pedro Farina, performed the first femoral artery cut down to access the aorta for an aortogram. Although accessible, it required surgical access and ligation for hemostasis. So this set the stage for next innovation by vascular, in vascular access by Sven Seldinger, who introduced a method still used today to guide uh, a wire and a small board needle uh, into the, the vessel of interest. Uh, so access to the left atrium was the next milestone. Um, and this was very challenging for and, and taken upon by the cardiologist John Ross, who viewed the existing methods to carry considerable risk. So these included transbronchial methods and supersternal methods. Uh, and it was a visitor to his lab uh, who was watching him catheterize a patient with an AST who inspired him to ask whether there's any way to cross an atrial septum when it was intact. And this inspired him to develop a method that we still use today using a long curved needle uh, through a sheet to access the left atrium. So this method was the first proven in a series of dogs with no complications. Uh, so with refinements to access techniques, catheter technology and materials, angiography and hemodynamics of the right and left heart were now possible. And the next step was refining coronary angiography. Um, and so in the 1950s, um, many were experimenting with different ways to do this. Uh, and the Cleveland Clinic cardiologist uh, Mason 
uh, Sonez in, in 1958 had an idea for semi-selective coronary angiography by positioning the catheter in a sinus, but not directly in the ostium. So we initially tested this method in dogs with some success. Uh, the opportunity for discovery uh, was upon him and he was not aware of the serendipity intervened uh, while catheterizing a patient for an unrelated reason. He decided to perform an aortogram after an LV angiogram without rechecking his catheter position. Uh, and at the onset of the power injection, his heart sunk immediately as he witnessed that the catheter intubated the right coronary artery and he watched 40 milliliters of contrast injected at high pressure into a patient's right coronary artery, of course, with excellent angiographic definition. Uh, now keep in mind, external compressions at that time were not used or described and he anticipated the worst, picked up a scalpel in preparation to open the chest and perform cardiac massage. But he looked up the monitor, he saw asystole, Remarkably, the patient was still conscious, and he immediately ordered him to cough, which converted him into sinus rhythm. Uh, from then on, he was much more careful in angiography with his angiography and managed to design a set of catheters for selective coronary angiography to be performed uh, from the brachial artery. Uh, and it was Melvin Junkin, Judkins and Kurt Amplatz who soon, uh, soon after developed other catheters that are still commonly used today. So with diagnostic methods uh, of the heart established in the early 60s, so the emphasis now was on interventions uh, in the heart. And in 1963, Charles' daughter uh, made an inadvertent discovery when passing a catheter through an iliac artery that was occluded to perform an abdominal aortogram. When he recognized that he could recanalize the right iliac artery inadvertently, he knew he was on to something. He later developed this uh, into the daughter technique, whereby sequential dilation of peripheral vessels was used to treat peripheral stenosis. And you may recall, this is not unlike the technique performed in 3000 BC in Egypt to treat urethral stenosis. Uh, his first case uh, in a human was an 82 year old who refused surgery uh, uh, for amputation. Um, and you can see the sex successful re recanalation uh, shown in this image. So Charles' daughter continued with innovations and his approach uh, stemmed from his love of mechanical things. And he said, if a plumber can do it with pipes, we can do it with blood vessels. He spent a lot of time developing new catheters and wires in his lab and fortuitously met Bill Cook at a radiology meeting who was at the time the only employee of Cook Incorporated. And Cook was the manufacturer for the first set of telescoping catheters that were performed, uh, that, that were used to perform the first angioplasty. Um, so despite daughter's ingenuity. He was not accepted by his surgical contemporaries. Seen here as a requisition for an angiogram that requested imaging of the left superficial femoral artery from a surgeon uh, with specific instructions to not intervene on said vessel. Daughter complied performing an angiogram that happened to show stenosis of both the superficial and deep femoral arteries and abiding by the order and avoiding an intervention on the superficial femoral artery. He successfully dilated the deep femoral artery, leaving the superficial one for the surgeon to augment later. The patient underwent surgical recanalation that was ultimately unsuccessful, but the patient's leg was safe due to daughter's, daughter's initial efforts. And within a year, um, uh, daughter's patient can be seen here hiking to the 11,000 foot summit of Mount Hood with his own leg alongside the man who saved it. Uh, although successful in many applications, uh, daughter's technique had limitation in, in that it required sheer force and this could result in the occlusion of distal vessels and a method that applied only radial force would be the natural progression for this technique to become more applicable and safe. So it was in the 1970s uh, that um, uh, Andreas uh, Grintzig um, uh, took on uh, the next challenge uh, and he was intrigued by daughter's catheters. Um, he's seen here with a prototype of his own invention a balloon tip catheter that he created in his kitchen with the help of his assistant, uh, Maria Schlump. Um, and the prototypes were constructed in his home using polyvinyl chloride for the balloon. And the first generation of, were single lumen design catheters that eventually evolved to a double lumen design uh, and were later developed by the Cook, uh, uh, the Cook Corporation in 1976. So his data and results were presented at an AHA meeting uh, in 1976, and this met with much skepticism. Fortunately, he met a man named Richard Myler, and they teamed up to perform the first coronary angioplasty in 1977 in San Francisco on patients under cardiopulmonary bypass. Uh, 
and later performed 15 more intraoperative angioplasties before the first percutaneous procedure in Zurich in 1977. Um, and at this point, the cardiology and surgery community finally started to embrace the idea of percutaneous angioplasty. So at this point in history is where things start to diverge um, between adult uh, cardiology and pediatric interventions. Uh, and in 1981, James Locke developed a LAM model to study balloon dilation in pulmonary artery, uh, pulmonary artery stenosis and demonstrated that balloon dilation improved the gradient and flow following balloon dilation in a pulmonary stenosis model. Uh, the mechanism of angioplasty was demonstrated on pathological examinations of the vessels that showed longitudinal tears um, without any aneurysm or rupture, and late follow-up showed scar formation in the tears as opposed to restenosis of the vessel. So two years later, uh, five children underwent balloon angioplasty with hypoplastic pulmonary arteries, uh, and uh, as seen, um, uh, was successful in, in these images here. So the first valved um, uh, to be subject for dilation was the pulmonary valve. And the first therapeutic cardiac catheterization occurred in 1953 uh, when Rubio uh, Alvarez pulled a wire tip through a pulmonary valve to release stenosis. And another early procedure in 79 when passing a Berman catheter through a pulmonary valve in a patient with critical pulmonary stenosis in much the same fashion as a septostomy. Um, it wasn't until 1982 that pulmonary valvioplasty as we know it today was performed by Gene Can on the patient shown um, here, whose name is Sharon Owens at Johns Hopkins. Uh, and the image shows uh, the stenosis um, that was relieved along with uh, the transduced pressure post valvioplasty. So aortic valvioplasty followed soon after in 1984 um, uh, by Zudi uh, Um uh, in Missouri, and all procedures were successful in the initial uh, studies with this with only mild aortic insufficiency. Um, and with the evolution of balloon angioplasty, the next step was implantation of vascular stents in 1987 that proved successful and seeded the development of new technologies and techniques in vascular stenting and congenital heart disease. Some of the pioneering cardiologists are shown here that include Charles Mullins, James Locke, William Schachter, uh, Julio Palmez, and Stanton Perry. And the first stent was a stainless steel uh, bare metal stent. Uh, the initial reports included the deployment of stents in the pulmonary arteries with 45 stents delivered in, uh, in total and only two migrated and one that required surgical removal. So very successful initial experiments. Um, and so at this stage, I'll take a step back to the 60s um, where we talk about some other interventions in congenital heart disease that brings us more to modern day uh, starting with William Rashkin and the septostomy. So initially tested on dogs, the BAS was and still is a successful intervention and is performed in the same manner today. Um, and in retrospect, uh, Charles Mullins reflected on the procedure and recalls there being both admiration and horror with the procedure, but this intervention inspired a number of invasive cardiologists and set the stage for further cardiac interventions. And in fact, it was the balloon designed by Miller was the first pediatric device to undergo prospective study and FDA approval. Uh, for uh, pediatric cardiac catheterization. Uh, so these are samples from the dogs performing that had performed the first BAS. Um, also in the 1960s uh, was the first development of a PDA device uh, closure in 1966 by Werner Portsman. The first manuscript contains detailed instructions on how to construct it uh, from a polyvinyl alcohol plug uh, in a wire frame uh, that accommodated a guide wire. It was successfully delivered using an arterial venous loop through a 14 French axis site, and the success rate was high at 95% with no mortality. Uh, it, and the only real major limitation was the axis site size that was limited to uh, larger patients. So this is a demonstration of the initial plug that was used for PDA closure uh, by Porsman. Um, and the evolution of this device continued over the next 50 years uh, with the next iteration, the Rashkin device. Uh, this consisted of double disc design introduced in 87. And uh, uh, the success uh, rate for this was relatively low at only 66% in some studies. Um, uh, uh, with a fairly high rate of embolization. The uh, device was redesigned at one point um, 
uh, but with minimal improvement. A number of the other devices were designed and tried in the 80s and early 90s, but none really were reproducible or safe as a surgical ligation at the time. Uh, and it wasn't until the ADO1 device by Amplatzer uh, in 1998 that changed the management of PDAs. The immediate and short-term results were excellent and continue to show reliable and safe results in long-term follow-up and eventually became the standard of care for children over six kilos and remains that today. Uh, so more re recently in the extension of PDA device closure uh, has gone to premature infants with a number of pre-existing devices uh, having been applied uh, in these patients. But most recently in 2019, the ADO2AS was approved for this indication with good results. Uh, in PDAs less than four millimeters in diameter. And other closure devices, so ASDs began in 1975 uh, with the King and Mills device. You see here a number of devices that never reached FDA approval for ASD closure. Um, there are three devices that are currently FDA approved, including the Amplatz receptacle occluder. After a number of failed devices in the 90s, the prospective study in 1997 on the Amplatz device showed that uh, its design was effective and safe uh, and subsequently approved in 2001. Uh, so the Gore device is similar uh, double disc design and was also approved in, in 2006. So here's the Amplatzer and the Gore devices. Um, so the latest frontier in pediatric interventional cardiology has revolved around uh, pulmonary valve replacement. Um, so here, uh, this is Philip Bonhoeffer. Uh, he developed the first implantable pulmonary valve consisting of a bovine jugular valve sewn into a CP stent. Um, this later became known as the Melody valve. Uh, so the first implant in a human was in the year 2000 uh, with the initial indication for implantation of a circumferential conduit from 16 to 22 millimeters. So its uses have been extended and employed in native outflow tract patches and uh, conduits up to 24 millimeters. Um, so the new generation of pulmonary valve replacements are designed to accommodate even larger uh, outflow tracts, including native uh, and patched uh, RVOTs. Um, and this is the latest generation of Sapien valve that can be dilated up to 29 millimeters uh, and, and can now be combined uh, with a self-expanding stent called the Altera to create a landing zone uh, for valves to be safely deployed in larger outflow tracts. Um, the alternative to this uh, is the Harmony valve. Um, uh, that just recently completed a three-year early feasibility study and approved for use uh, with good results. Canadian representatives are shown here uh, that were involved in the early feasibility early feasibility studies, including Dr. Drs. Lee Benson, Eric Horlick, and Mark Austin. Um, and so before concluding, since we're up to present day, uh, one of the other aspects of the field that deserves special consideration when looking at the history of pediatric interventional cardiology is to consider all the important areas of study that go beyond uh, commercial products, devices, uh, interventions, and interventions, and recognize the publication and dissemination of expertise among professionals and trainees um, that have allowed the field to grow and support innovation. One example of a Canadian contribution in this regard was Dr. Robert Freedom. Um, in many publications, education of trainees and texts on, in congenital heart disease, and shown here uh, one of his um, uh, uh, texts that was uh, created with a number of colleagues at SickKids Hospital in Toronto. Um, so thank you for your attention. <laughs>